Oh my goodness, it looks like we are live. Just want to make sure we've got some time for friends to show up here today. We'll give it a minute. All right, there we go. It looks like we're live. Hello, I see people are joining us already for this an interview. I am hoping we'll get lots of folks coming in and hanging out today. If you're here today, say hi in the comments. Let us know you're there. I want to make sure we get the chance to um, just hang out with everybody and interact today and introduce my amazing guest. So first of all, let me just say thanks for joining us. I'm excited because the social hour has now moved to its proper home with the Artist Forge. And so from now on, when you see us, you'll be seeing us as a property of the Artist Forge, which is basically a new platform designed all around mindset and helping us focus on one of the most important tools that any artist has, and that is their mind. Remember that art is created in the mind and uh, everything else is secondary to that. So today I'm super excited because I get to interview one of the raddest people that I know. Um, he is an award-winning artist and il illustrator, creates some of my favorite art that I have hanging in my house today. And I'm super excited to get the chance to chat with him about all of the new stuff that he's been doing and find out about the book that is in a Kickstarter right now. So please join me in welcoming the amazing Tyler Jacobson. Hello, good sir. Hello, how's it going? Super awesome. I'm super, super excited to talk to you today. I like this and new platform, it's very cool. I know, it's nice, right? Yeah, it's. I've not even heard of it. So I'm learning something right now, which is that oh. I need to get a better streaming platform than, um, and this might be <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, StreamYard is really super handy. It, it makes for lots of cool stuff that I really, really enjoy it. So I'm uh, glad to be doing that here because more than anything else, I've been looking forward to this interview and getting these interviews started up again. Um, was doing them all last year. You were one of my very first. And then of course, um, I started working for another company. didn't quite have the time, but now we're back. So I see you know we've got some happens. friends joining us. People, if you're joining us today, say hi. Say hi in the comments. want to see that you're here. We can share your comments on the screen. If you've got questions for Tyler, get them in there so we can share them and, and bug him a little bit. So Tyler, oh, yeah. how's it been, man? Gosh, it's been crazy. It has been, you know... <laughs> I mean, you you had mentioned that we were going to chat about this book that I have coming out, and that it's doing this kind of book stuff is a lot of work. Um, I I granted I haven't done like the lion's share. John Flesk and his folks have done the lion's share, but it's still a, a lot of stuff. Um, so I've been busy with that like crazy. Yeah, I bet. How long has it take just to put everything together? I mean, you had to. I'm sure like, what was it like? Okay, never mind. Let's start from the beginning. So yeah, sure. um, before we get into the book, before we get into the book, how was, was it, has that been the last half of your year? Like, is that what you've been doing since, since oh, the man. last time I'd we say, talked? Like, I think since the beginning of the year, I've been working on it because, you know, I mean, John and his folks are doing all the layout stuff and all that. And they're amazing at that. I don't know anything about it. So uh, I leave it to them, but they, they have, you know, obviously I have to give them all the assets. So I'm, I'm basically, I went through every piece of art I've ever done. And that was a weird trip down memory lane, going through all the art that I've done in the past 12 years, more than that, I'd say 15, 20 years. 
And there was a lot of stuff that was cringy for me, but I want it in the, I want that kind of stuff in the book. So I was working really hard to get in stuff that I necessarily didn't like to look at, but it was like important to show the context of, of, you know, retrospective on my career. So yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. But why John, was that important for you? I mean, like, I don't know. It, <sighs> It's like I think it's important for artists to see where other artists came from. You know, like most of the time, especially with like social media and portfolios, you know, people only show their best stuff. That's all you ever get to see. You don't get to see all the stuff that failed or was thrown away or wasn't very good. Or yeah, no, I mean, I guess those are all the categories. You don't get to see all of that. What would be crap or sacrifices to the art gods and yeah i think it's important to kind of i mean i didn't i i put most of my best work forward obviously for putting this book together but there's a few in there that are like i don't really like this piece but it's also like the first piece that i did for this company so i i want people to see like oh you know there's a journey and the journey is like you're not good right out of the gate it takes a while um sometimes you have to do i always tell young artists like you have to do hundreds of really bad pieces to become very good so maybe thousands of really bad pieces so yeah maybe thousands maybe th it's crazy i'm actually really glad that you are willing to do that because like you said i think we get into these false narratives of thinking that the artists we admire just are like gifted out of the womb and they've never had to work the 10,000 hours. They just had all of the skill and showed up in the world, you know, being able to make incredible things and the rest of us are having to just gut through it when that's, that's really not the case at all. Yeah. That I'm glad you mentioned that sort of 10,000 hours. I know that's some philosopher's book or something and I, and I don't know the name of it, but um, it's that a is it's a concept. by Malcolm Gladwell. That's it. Okay, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Okay, very good. I'm glad you're on on point here. But that <laughs> that concept is it's come up so much lately with me chatting with friends and family and um, other artists that you know obviously if talent exists it's like it, it's it it tends it must be a a particular interest somebody has in a subject and that's like where I guess talent could be born. But if there is talent, it's like forged through that those ten thousand hours. You have to work really hard. I mean, my brother's big into sports, so I always make the sport analogy when I'm talking to him about this. It's like like the really good athletes, they work really hard and practice constantly and put hours and hours and hours, hundreds, thousands of hours into, you know, if it's basketball, like doing a jump shot or three-pointers. Like they put way more time into that than people who aren't professionals at it. So that's sort of like the divide, I think, between the um, if there is talent. It, it has to do with putting in tons of tons of hours into the work yeah a hundred percent i mean <laughs> <laughs> get off up your soapbox um no i mean get on it i'm i'm all about soapboxes so i'm i'm really glad to hear you say that though especially somebody who um i mean by by all of the standards really that we use to judge art at least for the most part people would consider you successful. I mean, you've been working for brands that align with what you love, right? And um, being able to, you know, consistently produce work over the years. I mean, that's how you make your living. And for most of us as artists, man, that's all we're chasing after, right? And so to hear somebody who, you know, by our standards, we would say they've made it say, like, I'm, I worked hard for this. Like I put in the time and, and forged it in the crucible of like, practice and failure and going at it again and again and honing everything. Um, it's not just because for some reason you just are more gifted than somebody else. Um, oh, you sure. put the work in, I feel like that really has to be recognized. Yeah. And I think that maybe that's why that the, the argument comes up, right? Where people are arguing about talent versus, um, you know, natural ability versus like something you've worked really hard on or, and, and I get it. I, I think people get, like off put by that subject because they feel like, Oh man, you're, you're trying to say like, I didn't work hard at this or something. So I get it. It's, I think when it just comes down to it, most people that are out there and are professionals have worked really hard to get where they're located. And, and some of them have had great opportunities. So I, I mean, I can't say that I've had not had great opportunities. I got work pretty soon out of school and 
So I kind of had to, that crucible was doing jobs and I had to, that's where I got in the hours was just doing job after job after job, so. I think it's really important um, to mention that too, because I know I did definitely what we tell all photographers not to do, right? Like one of my first jobs was a wedding and we're like, oh my God, don't do that, please. Like if you were a brand new photographer, <laughs> please don't do weddings because there's so much there to screw up and, and there's you get one chance, you know, and you really don't want to ruin it. Um, but there's also, I think, you know, we, we've called it a crucible, right? There's There's something to... Number one, is anybody ever really ready? Like we we have this idea that as artists, like we have to go make our work as perfect as it can be before we ever get that first job. And the simple fact is like, it's it's never gonna be perfect first, right? Like even yeah, exactly. if we did a really, when we, we thought it was really great and five years from now, we're gonna look back at it and go, I cannot believe that they hired me <laughs> to do this I do that work. a lot. Like, I do that a lot. <laughs> You're totally right. It's not a... It, each piece, at least I think that you have to have the mentality that like if you're doing paintings or photography or any creative art, like each project has to be something that you're going to try and make better than the last one. So you have to always be pushing, always be sharpening this edge that's never going to get sharp enough. So, yeah, I, I think if, you, if you've like got complacent or like stopped trying to make each one better. I mean, what are you doing? You're like, you, you gotta, you have to keep forging and making it better. It's, I, there's an artist I love, Angus McBride, who was like, if you like the work that you did five years ago, then you're slipping. So it's, it's, it's this concept of like, you gotta, oh. if you like it, then you gotta change. And, 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 and I don't know, you're getting complacent. And I'm, luckily, I don't like most of the stuff right after I do it. So. <laughs> yeah, this got me feeling bad about myself because I'm like, mm, I still have some pieces. I look back and I'm like, yeah, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah. I better take a no. look at what I'm making. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a lot of pieces from like even 12 years ago that I love. So, I you know, I think Angus McBride was being um, a little hardcore right. there. But um, but I, I like just the general just concept of like Angus always <laughs> be getting better. Yeah, I know. He's dead. So it's okay. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry, Angus. <laughs> <laughs> long dead, long dead. We can make fun of him. We can rip his art off. Oh, all okay. <laughs> all right. Feel safe. Feel no, safe. but it, I, it's uh, like this quick. general concept of always try to be better, continue to be better. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. What do we got? Don't we got get questions? complacent. Yeah. Oh, just going to say hi real quick. So Dustin has joined us today. Hi, Dustin. Hey, Dustin. Amazing CGI artist. Oh, cool. Sweet. Well, yeah. Yeah. He's the coolest. Um, he, he does the most fun stuff. You should see his cosplay work. It is banging gets wow, cool wow. people come in his studio and builds 3d environments for their characters to inhabit. So he's got like, he's done the Batmobile and he's done, you know, no like the Mandalorian on different planets and stuff. Yeah. It's the most cool. So super excited oh, wow. to have you here, my friend. I'll be um, if you have up, questions, that sounds cool. Yeah. I'll send you links. <laughs> um, if you have Please questions do. for Tyler today, make sure you get them in and we will pull them up so you guys can share. Um, and Tyler can answer them. But yeah, I mean, there's there's something to that concept of of keep pushing. And we actually had this conversation. So on um, every weekday at 7 a.m. Mountain Time, so six for you guys on the, on the West Coast, I get together and host uh, basically a talk show in the morning called The Morning Walk and Photo Talk. And we, we talk for about an hour. I go for about a three-mile walk. And we have this conversation. And, and one of the ones that we had was around this idea of satisfaction. And is that something we should expect to have as artists? Is, is satisfaction a danger to us? Or is it something that we, can we get little pieces of it as we go and be like, okay, well, I'm glad I got this piece, but I still need to keep going. And it's interesting to hear for some people, they're like, yeah, I don't think we should ever really be satisfied. I think that you know, we should always be hungry and still pushing toward the next thing we want. And other people are like, well, yeah, but if you're never satisfied, what's the point in doing it? Maybe mm -hmm. like you be satisfied and then you look for the next satisfaction. So what are your thoughts there? Do you think that satisfaction is even something we can aspire to as artists? Oh, totally, totally. Like I'm not as like hardcore as that Angus McBride quote. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a hybrid. I'm, I'm kind of in between. I, th I think, and I go through the, I, I call it like the art, artist roller coaster of the emotional roller coaster of like i'm like manically happy about the piece i'm working on and it's almost finished and it's looking great to like crashing after that excitement and hating everything and then back up again 
it's like up and down, up and down, up and down. And, and the teacher like prepared me for that. He prepared the whole class for that when I was in art school. He was like, well, get ready. It's a, being an artist is going to be an up and down. And you just have to remember, you're going to come back out of it. And there's going to be a cool piece. So that's the striving for that satisfaction for me is when I, I, I love the satisfaction of like finishing a piece and being really happy with how it turned out. Um, and I'm always looking for that. Some pieces don't have that. Some pieces do. Um, so I, I think it's important to strive for that because like you said, otherwise, what, what are we doing all this for? Like it, it's supposed to be fun in the end. Ultimately it's supposed to be fun. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, what are, what are we doing it for? So it's kind of like, um, not the full satisfaction of I have arrived, but the satisfaction of I completed the thing I was trying to do. Right. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah then that's how I, I think I see it is I, I made something here that wasn't, that didn't exist before. And that's like the satisfaction I'm getting out of it. The excitement. Yeah. So when you look at your work now compared to, you know, cause obviously if you're including a lot of old work and some stuff you said, like makes you feel a little bit cringy in the new book and you look at that work compared to now, how do you think you've grown? Like, what do you see as the, the real growth spots? Like, is it, do you notice Gosh. like brush work? Do you notice composition? Do you notice the use of color? Is there anything that really jumped out at you? Um, color for sure. I think like when I was right out of school, I just didn't understand color at all. Um, and I think my mark making has changed dramatically. Like when, when I was in school, I was kind of copying a bunch of artists that I liked. And now I've actually forged, uh, just through repetition, really, I've forged basically a particular look that I think is my own. Um, I don't know if I can really see it, but I just have a way of, you know, solving forms and making marks that I continue to do that work for me now. And I guess that would be, you know, quote unquote, my style. Um, but so those two, I'd say were the biggest, um, yeah, color and mark making essentially. Color was just when you say mark me. making, what does that mean for folks who have no idea what you're talking? Oh, okay, about? so in in like terms of painting, mark, mark making is a is a combination of how you as an artist deal with edges. So edge control is a great way, a great term for it. Um, line, so like is is something a line or is it separated by value and not by actual lines? Um, it's a combination of those. And then it's a, it's a combination of, I guess the third vector would be how you paint with a brush, whether it's a digital brush or a real brush, um, how you apply the paint. Um, and I think those all blend together as one sort of continuum. You know, if you, if you make particular marks, that is your edge control and it also is your line. So um, it's, it's just a big combination of all of those things. Um, so if you look at some artists that are really painterly, you know, someone like Zhao Ming Wu, his edge control is, it's, that's all it is. His painting is all about edges and value transitions. Um, there's no line. And then if you look at artists that are like comic artists, it's all about line. And it's far less about um, controlling uh, edge transitions and blurs and all of that kind of stuff. So if that makes sense, gotcha. that, that would be... That would be what I would call um, all of those combined together make your your mark making. Okay, so mark that, making is that makes a big umbrella sense. term for for all of those aspects combined. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you if uh, it's always best, I guess, to frame this in examples. But you know, if you look at artists like um, Greg Manchez, like his mark making is really chunky, like big thick brush strokes, and then. Um, the way he deals with edges is often really soft because he's got oil paints. Um, so it's just like, and then, I don't know, there's other artists that are just way more fine, you know, like Boris Vallejo paintings or something are really finely transitioned almost. They almost look airbrushed, but they're in oils. So there's just, it's how artists sort of interpret the universe. And they have to, through repetition and practice, figure out how to make the marks that are become the shorthand for what is visual. Um, you know, some artists that are really good, you know, maybe someone like Bernie Wrightson or something can figure out, a, could draw an ear with just a few little lines. And then you'd be like, oh, that's an ear. I can see that. Um, and right. they've figured out that shorthand. And that, and that shorthand becomes our, our shape language or our mark making.
abilities. Gotcha. God, that's so interesting. And it's thinking of it. Um, I feel like this is the thing when I work on digital art or I'm practicing drawing where I'm absolutely the weakest and where my desire, like th that's where I, I want to be someday. Um, but thinking about it from a photographic perspective, it's crazy because that is a thing we don't get to do at all. And so, um, you know, that really falls under the realm of aperture choice and things like that, where we really are controlling the depth of field, where is their blur, where is there not, and, and what's in focus. But um, that's one thing I've always admired about analog artists that I wish had some way to transfer into photography. And I think there's a lot of experimentation with, you know, taking a photo and then actually painting it um, using the pixels and, and smearing and blurring and pushing them around a little bit, which is kind of fun. But I'd love to explore that because that's, um, and I know I've told you this before, but that's actually one of my favorite aspects of your work is, is, is the stroke itself, is the choice and how, and how we, you know, transition those things. Um, is, is one of my favorite aspects of your work. Every time I look at one of the prints we have, I'm just looking at the brush strokes and the direction and where's the edge control and where is it soft and how you've controlled the viewer's eye by, you know, like, it's amazing that a, a face can look real with nothing but three really hard edges and everything else is soft and that you see it and you're still like, this is a legitimate face, you know? It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's editing really in a lot of ways because there is... There's, you know, if, if say I took, re let's say I took reference for that face, I'm going to edit out, you know, with the photograph, I have a lot of information, like all of it, almost all of it. Um, but to paint efficiently and to paint with edge control and all that, you reduce it, you edit a lot out. You don't necessarily need all the information. You just need like, these are where the shadows are. These are where the shadows end. This is the transitions. I'm just going to knock all those in with simple shapes and plane shifts and and it's there. So there's, um, it's when you see a lot of like, especially really painterly fine artists, they're editing out most of the information that's there and reducing it down. Um, and that's a, a really important part of, of image creation is simplifying is the more you simplify, the better you are. It's, it's like a sculpture. You don't start with all the really fine details. When you're doing a big sculpture, you start with the big hard forms and that way, from just from that point, you've edited all the information out and you just have the big forms and then you start adding fidelity and where you stop kind of ends up being whatever your style is. You know, some people go all the way. Some people stop at a particular point and don't continue to add all that extra information. And then it's like, oh, it's really stylistic because that's where they ended. <laughs> so th right. there's a lot of approaches. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And um, something that, when you think about composition from a photographic perspective, so often if we're shooting, you know, I guess you could call it on plein air, but when we're, you know, at a scene and we're composing what's there and trying to look for what we're gonna include and what's gonna help tell the story and how we need to move in order to reframe things um, is kind of as close as we can get to, you know, removing what's there and then obviously playing with depth of field and light. Um, but. I'm really interested in this boundary between the ability to capture something and then from there in the editing process decide what stays and what goes and how can mm -hmm. I continue to manipulate forms so that they say what I want. And um, I guess it's not always a completely accurate representation of the thing as it is a representation of my, how I see the thing, right? Um, yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. And, you have to put it through your own lens, which is your own right. RSI. Yeah. Love that. And so we've got a couple comments. So Mario said, this is something I need to reprogram on my brain. I always aim to do details from the beginning instead of seeing the whole picture in a more abstract way. So for right. people who are stuck there, Tyler, what would you say, like, how should they approach making that transition to, to not focusing on the details so much at the beginning? Yeah, that's the, that's the editing um, aspect, especially with fine art. And, and I'd say in illustration as well, it's um, start with the big forms. So, you know, if you're painting, th this is often just block ins, you know, block in your shapes, block in your values um, and do them in a really broad way. If you're trying to, you know, it gets difficult when you're trying to preserve a drawing that's underneath 
Um, but I just do that with like transparent medium. Or, and if it's digital, that's m much easier because you can keep your drawing on top of everything, which you can't always do with traditional uh, mediums. But um, yeah, it, you work in broad strokes first. And especially if you're crafting an illustration or just a regular fine art painting, work really small. Start with really tiny, people call them thumbnails or just tiny sketches and use only a few values. Um, I tend to use like a dark value, a mid value, and a light value, and then try to build your whole composition that way. That way you're, you're forcing yourself to not get into all those little tiny details first. Um, the details don't even matter in the end. It's all about really good value compositions. Um, what If you have great details in the end, cool. But if you look at people like Howard Pyle and Norman Rockwell and JC Leindecker and Dean Cornwell and all those golden age fellows, um, they had really strong compositions to start and then they got really good reference to, and they basically like crowbarred all that reference into the cool composition that they had already created. Um, so start simple, start with just a few values and start really small. If it reads well at a really tiny size, it's going to read great at a big painting. Mm, that's a really good point. And I know um, the last time we talked, I mentioned trying to go at that by limiting my brush size and saying that I can only use a brush that's this large and I can't go any smaller than that. Yeah, um, that's a great way to do it. Because <laughs> that's my temptation is like, ooh, eyelashes, right? I can't just be like, look, a, a jagged line and there's eyelashes. Like you'll believe they're eyelashes because of where they're at. I'm like, no, I need strokes. <laughs> I need like well, yeah, 15 that, individual eyelashes. That's the challenge, right? We really want to do that. We want to do those things because we can see them. And with our eyes, we can look at a person's face and we can focus on the, the little details. So I, I, the trick for me when it comes to that is... Um, if you look at like a lot of the old paintings from like the 1700s and 1800s, everything's really soft. It's this technique called sfumato where, where you're painting smoke. Everything, nothing ends in a hard edge. It's all this really soft edges. So eyelashes are just like a soft, dark area. They're not painting little eyelashes. They're just painting the soft, dark area. And then everything that turns away from the form is soft and um, and then they pull focus just on that. If it's a portrait, it's always, they pull focus on the triangle of the face. So the, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. They, those are where you get the darkest darks and the lightest lights. So that glint in the eye and then the darkness, like the super dark black pupil. That's where they put all their detail. Everything else is like smoke. Um, if you can go to a museum and see these paintings from back then, particularly like the 17, 18, early 1800s, late 1700s, they are, it's, everything is soft. It's just this endless soft image, except for where they wanted you to see, which is the, the triangle of the face. Um, so that's a yeah, trick for that, composition. Make a big blurry image and then tighten it in one spot. And no matter what, <laughs> the, the eye is going to go to that tight spot. Right. Yeah, this is for, for photographers, guys, this is like 1.8 and below, right? This is where we're like, give me the shallowest depth of field possible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Like that's, that's definitely, so it's really interesting. Um, and you said it's called sfumato, say that again. Sfumato. Yeah. It's an Italian term, sfumato. sfumato. But it's, it's, I think it's, I think it roughly just translates to smoke. Um, so you're painting with smoke essentially. Right. Yeah. The reason I think that's really sticking in my head is because oftentimes one of the praises that we'll tend to give um, a, a portrait or an image is, is we're like, oh, it's so painterly, right? Um, and I always wonder, what are we talking about there? Because sometimes it seems like we're talking about um, the range of colors and the pose, because maybe uh, we're used to seeing when we compare the portraits that we make now and we're looking at old masters and we're like, okay, so what we actually see is the yellowing varnish. Everything has that kind of uh, mm -hmm. filmy yellow quality to it. And so the blacks are kind of brown and the whites are a little yellow. And so you're like, oh, okay. So we have that thing that we're looking at. Or are we talking about, you know, the light patterns and the and the pose? But really, you're making me wonder how much of that is actually just the sharpness and those transitions, the softness of those transitions. Because I've been <laughs> I've been playing with this for a while, but in in a lot of my recent work, after I finish editing the photograph, I actually run an oil paint filter over the top of it and I take out all the details, so I actually lose all the sharpness. So 
um, everything gets softened just enough so that it loses some of its photographic quality. And people have been commenting a lot and they're like, oh, it reminds me of a Renaissance painting. And I'm thinking to myself, mm. like he, I wonder if that's what I've done is by, by softening a lot of that, if I'm kind of mimicking that quality. So when you said that, I was like, ooh, have I done that by accident? <laughs> like, am I, I would, kind of yeah. mimicking that? I'd suspect that you are because you, you're doing essentially exactly what those um, old painters were doing was everything is a soft edge, treat everything soft. And then the, the areas where you make it hard, a hard edge become focal points. And there's also that philosophy of like, you know, if, it, if you're painting hair, you know, eyebrows, hairlines, um, beards, um, all of those transitions are soft because they're little tiny hairs and so you can't really see them all. You can't really paint them all unless you're painting this giant thing. So you just treat them all as a soft value transition as opposed to a bunch of little hairs. Um, mm. So that's why you, you have all this softness and then you can tighten wherever you want. Because once it's, once it's all achieved there through softness, you know, if you look at um, Rembrandt paintings are really great versions of this because everything's these little soft buildups of paint. Um, and then at the very end, little hard hits here and there of darkness or, or right. just a really sharp edge or a really bright highlight. Yeah. I just want to paint every hair. It's so bad. I can't make eyebrows at all. <laughs> I'm like, do, yeah. do, do, do. Like I can't just be like, there, like you'll know that that's an eyebrow. No, I feel like I just have to have them all. It's such a struggle. So what I really I want to bug you about a little bit um, is oh. One of the biggest aspects I know of your work is being able to tell a story, right? Like in a single image, we need to get the feel of a character and we need to feel like um, we've stepped into the world because, you know, that's that's what people are wanting from that work. They're looking for, you've got a magic card, a tiny description of what it does, and then here is an image that has to tell a story. So I would love to mm -hmm. hear from your perspective what it's like to tell a story in an image as an artist. Like, what are you considering? What goes into building up an image into a kind of storytelling image? Oh, okay. That, no, that's a great question. That, that, that's the challenge, I think, especially with illustration, especially with magic cards, because they're two inches, you know? So the, it's this tiny little box that you have to make a composition read in. And oftentimes they, you know, not oftentimes, but every once in a while they ask, for a little too much that's that, that's going to fit in there and then you know it's up to us to sort of edit out what we don't think will fit but what can still tell the story um and i guess the best way to go about that if you're if you're starting to to build an illustration is to think of the there's only three moments really that you can depict so you can depict right before something's about to happen right when something is happening and right after something has happened um and you have to pick what's what tells the story better in in those scenarios. You know, if if it's a magic spell, usually it's right when it's happening is the best way to to tell that story um, for fantasy illustration. Um, but if it's if you know if your goal is anticipation, I I like things that are like right before they're about to happen, um, like right as a character is about to like strike a monster or something, that moment right there. Um, but you know, another great one, which I don't do too much of in my work, but after something significant has happened is, is also a really cool storytelling opportunity. So if you're, you know, illustrators out there that are working on this, think about those moments and what is, what serves the purpose of the illustration the most, um, and then pick the right moment, um, to basically fit in with what you want the outcome to be. Right. So a big thing being at what moment in the story does this take place? And then that informs kind of the action that you see in the scene. Yeah. And, it, you know, if it's right in the middle of things going on, that's where that's probably where you're going to get the most motion in your in your um, painting. So I, I, I tend to pick that one a lot right in the middle or right before something's about to happen. That's usually where you get the most motion. The quiet moments are tend to be after um, after something has occurred. Um, every once in a while, the quiet moments can be before something's happening, like a character walking down the stairs or something like that. But right. Right in the right in the middle and right before the action. That's usually where you get the most motion. And if you want motion in your work, then choose those those points in in time. Right. It's hard because do you find illustration one harder is, to do than the other? Oh, um, I find the anticipation of a moment. 
to be a, is a, a harder storytelling challenge, but it's usually pays off the best. Everyone wants to show like right in the middle of a punch or a smash of something, or everyone wants to show that because that's like the real poppy comic image, you know, that's most comic books show those, the big kablam, you know, Batman punching someone and the big sound effect. Like that's right in the middle of the action. Um, everyone wants that because it's such a big payoff. But I think there's a lot nicer, more subtle storytelling opportunities if you do if you do it before something has happened. It's it's that concept in filmmaking of um, two plus two equals four. Don't give the audience four. Give them two and two, and let them draw their conclusions. So the um, doing that in a illustration is don't show them the outcome, but give them the um, ability to imagine what might happen next. Um, so you're not, you're giving them enough information to tell the story and, and now it's up to them to sort of imagine what might soon happen in this tale that, that this, this moment in time that they're receiving. Right. So it's all about balancing the tension then, huh? Yeah. Um, I, I'd say so for sure. I like keeping, so keeping it right on the edge of, of what's about to happen. And then all the tools for image creation come in there. Like, where do I want them to look for them to think that something's about to happen? And then you play around with all that stuff. Right. Yeah. That's a really good point. And what I'm really interested in as well. So we have, you know, okay, when does this image take place? Is it before, is it during, is it after? And then also when you're creating a scene, how much are you thinking about the story that you're telling about the character. So I know, I mean, coming from coming from a photographic perspective, when I'm putting something together, of course, I'm looking at the environment, right? Like, where does this take place? And what does that tell me about the story? And then the clothing, like, is it clean? Is it dirty? Is it worn? Is it new? Is it, you know, what kind of thing are they wearing? Like, and you have to get across so much in these paintings because you, you so often have these characters and you're telling like everything about them that we can learn about them, we have to know by looking at the image, right? So um, how how do you choose those things? Does that come in a brief? Is that something that you kind of have to design and then get approval for? Or what does that look like? I mean, yeah, often it does come in a brief, especially the setting, um, which, which ends up for illustration, the setting ends up becoming like a, basically its own problem to solve, right? It's like, okay, we're in this, how do I depict let's say it's a big snowy scene. It's like, okay, well, how do I depict what they want me to in this scene where it's all snowy? So now I have a high key, high value scene, right? Everything's going to be pretty white. Um, so it, it basically becomes like a design constraint. You know, it's, it's, it, this thing's happening in a cave. It's like, okay, well now everything's kind of, now, now it's a light game. Now I'm playing with light uh, because it's in a dark cave. Um, so th th those are all like design constraints. I think that, that, um, illustration that's, that's what illustration is all about um you're the client needs something and they usually need it very specifically um and so you it's our job to basically problem solve those scenarios and create a cool looking piece of art but but the we, we're also thinking about all the same things like like you are like oh is the clothes dirty is, is what what about that tells me more about the story you know i do that all the time it's like if i'm painting a a traveler or a soldier or a warrior. It's like, are, are, have they been through a lot of stuff? Um, does their outfit depict that? And that in itself is telling the story like, oh, their cloak is super dirty and their armor is all busted up. It's like, okay, so now this is a character that has a story behind them. Like, well, how, how did they get to here? I want to know more. Um, so that, that all those little things create little dialogues with the viewer um, as to what's going on. Um, they're all important sure. to think about. And if I'm getting yeah, a job absolutely. from, if I'm getting a job from like, let's say magic, uh, I, and I tend to add those things in. I'm like, th this is like a branded character of yours. You know, magic has their sort of the X-Men type characters. It's like, well, I want to add a little dirt or grime to them because I want to show that they've just been through a, a fight or something. So yeah, it's, those are all little details that add to the story and are important to storytelling. For sure. So I would love, um, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to actually, let me see if I can do this here. That was going to make me play with it. I'm going to have to open it up separately. I would love to kind of talk about 
this particular image because it is one of my favorite of yours. Um, or oh, which and one? The background? Of, yes. Oh um, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, so I wanna I wanna see if we can chat about that one a little bit because um, one of the things that we focus on a lot at the Artist Forge is looking at um, looking at how every piece of storytelling is controlled from the angle of the camera to the lighting choices to the aperture, just all of those things, right? Um, and so I want to see, I, like, I would, I'm going to try to see if I can grab this real quick. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can put it up or see if it will let me, yeah, yeah, see if it will let me do it. Because from a photographic perspective, there are so many things that I can look at and say, um, okay, if I had shot this, this would have been the reason for it. And, um, Let me see if I can, for some reason, it doesn't want to let me grab it. I wonder if we can, if I can just go. Yeah, if you can like hide us or something. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Except when I do, let me see. I might be able to share it over myself. Can I do that? Let's see if you that's can. A... And I'm going to play with this hey. for a second. Let me grab the image really quick. Got everything on my other monitor. Hold on a second. That makes things helpful. <laughs> yeah, it's and just here like I am, like fighting new... new computers. Man, I don't like it. I just want the ones that I've already. I know everything about them, and I don't have to do anything anymore. I'm like just switching to a new one right now, so it's it's difficult oh, for me. Um, let's I see. Can. I think I can. I think I've just figured out how to share my screen I want to share everything got some NDA stuff that cannot be seen let's Ooh. see let's... are we seeing this oh, wow. oh yeah that's my uh -huh. website I see that you did it yeah you did it. I know oh, I've got it on there let's see is it in illustrations is it in this one or is it in yes a different one? yes it's like the third it is in this one okay maybe oh maybe it's a little farther down i know it's in there gosh i hope it is okay now everybody just gets a look at your amazing oh yeah work. i have to update that sorry everyone <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like i have a lot i'm not of, mad about it, it. i'm it's, very behind on my fantastic. website there it is Exalted angel. All right, let's let this guy pull up. There we go. All right. So as we're it's like really just slowly happening there, can we even see just it? Grinding, just grinding through the internet. I know it. It's terrible. Well, Lately, my wait. Wi-Fi has just been struggling. I saw something. There it is. There it is. There we did it. We did it. Success. All right. It's there. It's there. Okay. So what I would love to, what I would love to chat about here is there's a whole bunch of things happening, right? So from a photographic perspective, when we've been breaking down this image, we have the angel with two swords. The camera angle is low, so we're looking up at the angel a little bit. We've got mm -hmm. this beautiful backlight that's happening that help, is help, helping to pick everything out. We've got the cold and the warm contrast. We have the covered face, we have the armor. So there's a lot going on that's helping to tell this story, right? From your perspective, as you're creating this, how are you making these decisions? Like, how do you choose your camera angle, Tyler? Like, what are the things that you are thinking about that leads to us seeing this image put together the way that it's put together? Um, yeah, I think that, especially like where I place the camera kind of comes from my sketch process. But there's also certain angles that look more, I guess, you know, for lack of a better word, ep epic, you know, more heroic looking and it tends to be those up shots um you know if there's a 
if you put the camera a little bit low and you're looking up at a person, they they get they look more heroic. They have the almost like hero proportions because you're kind of I don't know everything's perspective. It's a, it's being pushed into space. So and that if you look you know throughout all the comics and um, fantasy art, it's always like the really heroic shot is you're always kind of looking up at the character and they're looking up and away somewhere. It's it's like it's almost cheesy. It's used so much at this point, um, but it totally works. So I use it all the time for key art, for cover art, um, for like the box cover art for magic. I, I do upshots on just about everything because it, it just looks really heroic. Um, yeah. So that was, that's kind of where I started on this. I was like, well, this is an angel. Angels, you know, in lore are flying through the air. So, you know, Pretty much when anyone depicts an angel, it's almost always from a, a lower camera angle. And so, yeah, I guess that's where I started for this. I, I wanted that heroic um, angle. So it was uh, the upshot. And the the challenge on this was the art description said it, that the angel has a veil over its face. Um, right. So I'm like, okay, here we go. This is going to be a challenge because <laughs> this is... this is already hard to depict. Um, it's already a hard thing to paint. You know, I don't know if you've seen those sculptures of um veiled <gasps> people they're incredible they, that's they like the it? peak it's of so masterwork <laughs> so i was like okay i love those sculptures i kind of want to somehow achieve that look but in paint um so i had to get i had to get really good reference for this because it was really hard to um just make up i make up a lot of stuff but some things are just you got to get reference for so <laughs> So how how did you go about getting reference for this? Did you ask some? Did you just shoot somebody with something over their head, or, or what were you doing there? Yeah, I I actually had some some really really transparent, translucent, I guess, of fabric, and um, I, I set up the light from behind because I wanted that subsurface scattering that that really like lime green kind of light coming through, um, and then I had a light up front that was really hot and warm because I wanted the I wanted the temperature play that that was my the beginning of creating this was I, I wanted the hot and cold temperature play and I wanted um sort of classic um I guess Howard Pyle used to paint paintings like this moonlight paintings um and that classic palette would then was viridian and then basically cadmium so really hot colors um so it's a it's a red green split essentially um so for this one I use the I use Viridian for the sky because it's like such a great way to paint night skies. Most, most film like in television, they tend to use a really weird blue filter, but green works so much better in a painting for, for night skies. The, um, I'm not sure why, you know, if you go out into actual moonlight, there's really barely any color at all. So um, I think it's just a trick, trick of the eye. Gr green tends to work really nicely. So that's kind of became the cornerstone of the composition, the color composition. Um, right. Was the green and the, the reddish orange. Right. And I know, so you mentioned the last time we talked that if you're painting digitally, you'll often paint in grayscale and then go back and add color. How, like, what is the difference for you when you are painting analog? I mean, if you're, you're, you know, working in true life here. So how do you, manage the values then um do, are you doing value sketches beforehand or or what is that yeah i do a full so i've been doing a lot of painting and, and oils and just traditional painting lately and i do most of my preliminary work digitally and i, I solve all of those um i do color sketches digitally and i do value sketches digitally um so i do all the preliminary work digital just because i've i've used those tools for so long that i'm i'm pretty quick at them so they save me a lot of um, time. And so, yeah, I, I do. And it's so flexible digitally. You can do all kinds of really quick color studies so fast. Right. So I do that. I do all of that in digital still. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Definitely, um, definitely has to save your butt when you think about um, how many canvases you might have used <laughs> if you had to kind of figure everything out. Um, yeah, yeah. I used to do those in art school. You know, we would we would print out, we would do our drawing and, and like mess with it digitally, but then we would print out like five of them and paste them down and then do little color sketches on top of them. Um, but, you know, the digital tools are, are just as good, I think, for that, if not better. For sure. 
So um, I love the conversation around storytelling and how we make these decisions because I feel like visual literacy is something that's really under discussed in um, art education in general, um, particularly in kind of the, the the commercial realms of, you know, you go find a tutorial or, or something like that. And often we get a lot of the how to's um, and not necessarily the why to's. And I feel like when we critique work, often that's what we're missing is we've got little bits and pieces of story, but nothing that comes together in a cohesive way so that we feel like we're looking at a piece that's meant to be something. Um, and so it's really cool to have those conversations where you can pick somebody's mind a little bit and hear, you know, like, yeah, this was the inspiration for this. And, and these are the reasons for these choices because without that, we just, we, we might end up with good technique, but what is the point? You know, if, if you've mm -hmm. got great technique and you're not telling a story, what's the point really of having good technique? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think that, when it comes to describing this stuff, the why is really important. Um, just telling someone to like paint this way or draw this way because is useless. And it, it comes in the, in the same respect when it comes to like critique. Um, I, I, you know, through art school training, it was, we learned to critique by not just say this isn't working, but to say this isn't working and here's how to fix it. That's also the, that's also the why and the how it's, it's not saying, oh, I just don't like that image. It's saying, oh, this image can be better this way, and here's the solution. Otherwise, it's not constructive. It's just useless criticism. So um, right. I think those those come together in both explaining how art can be done. Um, you know, don't be don't be like really hard rules about it, but explain why these particular techniques work and how they work. Um, is goes a lot a lot farther in the overall philosophy of art creation. Um, yeah, for it, sure. You know, it gives because like a before lot of you were talking about that. Oh, forgive me. That was <laughs> unexpected. Um, <laughs> remember always to turn off all of your noises your before off. you yes. interview somebody live <laughs> in the world, in the real world. Um, yeah, because you were talking about before, you know, that technique of um, basically everything is soft, the details are where the eyes go. And of course, we know like the contrast draws the eye, whether that's color con contrast or value contrast or uh, line contrast, I mean, like hardness versus softness, all of those things. But if you were just to go, you know, this is a painting technique, now go about your business, nobody would know why things should be soft in certain places and why your edges should be hard in other places. I mean, um, without really understanding what that technique brings to the table or why you would employ it, it just becomes one more thing you have to manage without understanding what it's serving. Yeah, there's, there's, there's that, um, yeah, it becomes a dead end if you don't know why it's useful. It's sort of, I guess, like, learning about making images is is kind of like it's kind of like similar to what magicians have to do like they learn human perception they learn how people see things and perceive things so learning how to make paintings or illustrations is learning all about human perception because it, you know you're not making an actual if you're painting on a canvas or a watercolor block or whatever in a flat object you're not really nothing's three-dimensional. It's all a trick. So you have to understand the, the tricks of perception. Like, how do I make that thing look three-dimensional? Um, and if, if it's just like, well, just do this and always do that, you're, you're going to run into blocks. Like you're not going to be able to combine all these different concepts. If you don't understand why they work, if you don't understand why people perceive when they look at an object, why they perceive it as three-dimensional. Um, once you learn all those whys, you can, you can culminate those skills into one place. Um, once you learn why light behaves the way it does, why color is, is completely relative to how light behaves and why, you know, three dimensional forms, why they appear like they do to our eyes. Those are all really super useful things to learn um, because you can start manipulating all those little tricks. And it's just like a magician would manipulate human perception that you're doing the same thing. Yeah, I think that's such an important and valuable point and something we miss so often. Um, and particularly, I feel like us as photographers, because we're taking things that people already see and capturing those things. And often we don't think about the fact that 
um, we we still have the ability to control perception based on what we include and all of the those little tricks that we talked about before. How high or low were you shooting them? What lighting did you choose? Where is the light placed? Are you using practical lighting? Like it's motivated, there's an actual light source or are you faking some kind of light that we don't know where it's coming from? What kind of light is it? Is it natural light or is it fluorescent light? Are we, you know, just all of these, all of these little tricks that go into deciding how to put an image together um, sometimes can be lacking for us because it's easy to fall back on the fact that we have everything there. Like you can walk into a scene and look, all of this stuff is here. Um, and you forget, you know, I always liken it to when I used to shoot boudoir, we would sometimes shoot in hotels and I would destroy the whole room. Like I'd be taking things off walls and pulling things out of the way. And like, it would be a big, huge mess when I was over. But I'm like, I can't have all this stuff in my scene. You know, I'm like carrying TVs around and stuff to get them out of the background. But we really do have to control that. Otherwise we're, we're kind of at the, at the mercy of circumstance. And it feels like that's probably not a really great way to make art. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like that you're also thinking about the, all those same things that you need to control, you know, the, especially like when you're mentioning like what kinds of light to use, you know, like if it's all hard light, not all really hard direct light and you have all those really hard shadows, sometimes that's all those hard edges are really uncomfortable. So if it's more mm. smooth light, you know, like that Rembrandt light where everything's kind of smooth and there's no real hard shadows, then it's a little more calming and it's like a cooler light. If it's a really hot light, you get a different emotional response to a very cold light. And um, I think about that stuff in illustration. It sounds like uh, photographers have to think about all the same things. And I mean, I'm starting to not see a huge difference between the, the two, <laughs> aside from cameras. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think the thing that I miss the most when I'm photographing as opposed to painting is the just the stylization of, like you said, um, the mark making. I think that's what mm -hmm. I miss the most. I miss seeing brush strokes. I miss seeing the hand of the artist, I guess, in, in those aspects. Of course, it's there in style and aesthetic choice and, you know, like the, the kind of, um, I guess you could call them like the hallmarks of the way that we make things. Um, whether we choose certain types of light more often and just kind of all of those things. But I do miss the brush strokes. I feel there's something in that for me that I just am really drawn to that I miss with photography. Um, and yeah. that makes, it does make me want to land in some hybrid space where I'm taking a photo and painting on top of it. So I can, I can have both of those things, but I've not of at all mastered that idea yet. Oh, well, that's challenge. It's in itself, you know, it's, it's, that's really hard to do because you, you're, you're riding the edge of this fine line between what is obviously a photograph and what is painted. And there are some great, like fine artists out there that do these super hyper realistic paintings right. and oils of photos. And they're not even, they're going to the extent of not worrying about that sfumato edge because they want it to look like a photograph. So they're, they're in there right. like painting every little tiny hair. And that is amazing stuff. It's just, it's not necessarily the kind of art I want to be doing. I don't have the patience, sure. for it, but, but it, it exists and it's definitely, a it's definitely a thing like that. That is a, yeah. that's a goal to reach. And I, I love that you mentioned, you know, if you're using a lot of hard light everywhere, sometimes you get a lot of hard edges, which can be uncomfortable. And it's interesting because if that is your purpose, like if you want to make an image that makes somebody uncomfortable, man, that would be a great thing to do, right? Like mm -hmm. they're, they're, we, we make these assumptions. I think sometimes we learn these techniques and somebody will say, okay, you know, if you want to make a balanced composition, like here's the rules of composition and here's what is pleasing. And, you know, you can place it along these lines, you can use this ratio, you can do these things. And you're like, okay, so now every time I shoot, I'm shooting in rule of thirds, because that's how you do the thing. And not thinking about the fact that, okay, what if I wanted to make an unbalanced composition? What if I want to cause the viewer to feel uncomfortable when they see this? Um, then I'm taking that that rule, right? I'm using that technique to suit what my vision is. And I'm not necessarily just being a slave to what I feel like the the common you know rules should be around how we make a thing um 
I yeah, feel like you, that, I mean, those are. Go ahead. I was going to say, well, once you learn those rules, that then you know how to break them. Uh, it's that's the playing with human perception. You know, if you know the rules to um, things that are comfortable to look at, the compositional, you know, the golden ratio, things like that, then well, yeah, now I can dial that. I can play with that dial. If I want someone to be uncomfortable, now I move it outside of those bounds, and now they're the viewer is going to be uncomfortable because it looks weird. Um, so it's it's a great it's a great tool to to play with, especially with like you said with light edges, you know, with shadow edges, you know, you can you can really start messing with their perception because those all those shadow shapes define the the three dimensional form. So once you understand that they do that, you can start messing with you can create all kinds of shapes. Um, so there's, yeah. there's a lot of like, it's a learning all these little things is like a big culmination of creating images and, and having the intent that you want. You want people to see right. what you want. Um, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird dialogue you're having with the viewer essentially. It's so cool. And as you said that, it just struck me that that is one of the brilliant things about the cinematography and the lighting in film noir because you have all of this hard light, which means everything is sharp. The edges of the shadows are sharp and sharp things are dangerous. And so yeah. that it's not only the contrast in the light that makes it feel so mysterious and dangerous, it's also the fact that there's all of these sharp edges, like the lighting everything is sharp all the shadow like yeah everything's pointy yeah, becomes, of course there's this subconscious and... yeah it works really great I, i'm a big fan of cinematography so uh, in film so like i love when i see a cinematographer who and the cinematographer always gets no credit <laughs> um but i love to see like when a director of photography makes all these really cool choices to put you in that mood to make you uncomfortable to um, and they they're using all the um, their knowledge of of light and composition and um, edges and all of this comes together to put you in a weird space. Like uh, my favorite one is um, a, a DP named Roger Deakins, who's worked with um, the Coen Brothers a ton. Most of the Coen Brothers movies he's worked on, he's just a, a master at at those manipulations, like playing with all kinds of color, um, especially like if you saw the the uh, uh, Denny Villanova. I can never pronounce the director's Denis name. But Roger, De <laughs> yeah, Roger Deakins did the DP work on the cinematography work on Blade Runner with with him and all of his okay. most of his other movies. Um, not the original Blade Runner, but the new Blade Runner. And right. when you see the the way he constructs shots and the way he plays with color and composition and edges and softness and lighting, it's just this. It's like a masterclass in how to do perfect cinematography and as well as all the the coen brothers movies that he's worked on they're, they're just phenomenal stuff yeah yeah there's so much uh, so much to learn from everybody i feel like i want to grab everybody and soak it all in because i have been lucky enough i got to interview um pedro luque who is a, a, a uruguayan cinematographer who works in the states and he just um the one i the the movie they had just finished when i interviewed him was um antebellum and the oh, wonderful. they actually used the yeah it was great they actually used the the lenses from Gone with the Wind um, to film oh, very that cool. to film that movie and it was cool just to to talk to somebody about everything that they think about and recognize that visual language really ties across all of these genres whether we're illustrating or we're um, photographing or we're you know filming it just the Visual literacy is universal and sometimes the small aspects change, right? But the storytelling choices that we make seem to really carry across all, all genres. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I mean, the, the university universality, is that even a word? Um, anyways, the, <laughs> yeah, of it, the, the universal yeah, nature of good. it is because we're all, we're all humans. So we all have the same, sort of perception we all view the world kind of through the same tools um so it's once you i guess understand those tools you can really start telling really cool stories um in in any format yes 
Yes. Okay. So now that we've talked about that a little bit, let's yeah. get into the book. So oh, yes. what is happening with this? Let's let's talk about how this happened because um, <laughs> all of a sudden it's like, what? Tyler's having a book? Yeah. And of course I have to have it. So um, (laughs) let's, let's, let's hear about how this happened. Yeah. So um, this guy must've been two years ago before the pandemic, John Flesk had had approached me at, um, I'd know I'd worked with John a few times on judging spectrum and um, other book publication stuff. I'd never put a book together, but I'd worked with him for various art events and seen him and chatted with him there. But um he asked me if I wanted to create a book with him. He's done books with a few artists. He usually does books with like Frank Cho and Al Williamson. And he recently did one with um, Tron and he's just got a, a great publication. All of his books are, are very bespoke and um, individually put together for, for the artist. And they're not, it's not like a, there's no template and then you just throw all the art in it. He wants to tell the story of the artist and I sound, I was really excited about that because I didn't want to just create a book that was just, you know, image after image after image. I wanted, it's obviously completely full of images, but I wanted to um, kind of tell the story of me becoming an illustrator and then the story of my illustration work. So I, I in a way, I wanted to tell more stories like I already do, I guess, with um, painting and, and image creation. So we started down the road. Um, we agreed to work together, and I started collecting all the art I could find. It was like well over 300 images, I think, of of stuff that we wanted to put in. But the the book is only about 160 pages or so. So um, only? we had to cut down a lot. <laughs> I had to cut out a lot of art. <laughs> oh God. Um, I'm so excited. <laughs> it's going to be cool. It's, it's going to be good. We're going to do a cool format as um, I guess if the people are watching, it's the Kickstarter. You can just look up on Kickstarter, um, the art of Tyler Jacobson. Um, and then if you go to my website, it's, uh, it's like the first banner you can click on. I'm so, going to share it in the comments right now. Oh, great. Great. Um, but yeah, Boop. obviously we would love your support. We, we got funded pretty quickly, which is exciting. And now we're going into like stretch goals. I think we got about 10 days left, so we're excited for little stretch goals we'll do. We've already met a couple of those, um, which will be uh, basically there'll be two different time lapse videos of me um, painting the the main cover of the book, and then we're doing like a slipcase cover um, for Ooh. the super special edition version. Um, for the fancy stuff, huh? The fancy one, yeah. And we're doing a cool format, which I really like in art books. Is a it's I guess you would call it the record format. It's like kind of 12 by 12. Um, so it gets a lot of a lot of my work is okay. horizontal. So it's a great way to showcase big horizontal images, and we're doing some cool big double page spreads and stuff like that. So a lot going right. on. Right. So a- as an artist, what does it mean to have a a book out? Like, is this something that you had never thought of, and all of a sudden somebody approaches you and you're like, "Holy cow, that would be great!" Or was it something you thought maybe one day you'd love to have a book out, or what does it mean for you to have this project like actually be a thing? I mean, it's fully funded now, so it's it's going to happen. It's going to be real, yeah. We're we're almost done doing design work. Um, but I don't know. I I'd, I'd thought about it. I guess for a while, I was like, one day I'm going to do an art book. But I, um, when John asked me, I was like, oh, um, yeah, that'd be great. I didn't think. I guess I didn't expect because when he asked me, I was about like ten years into my career. Now it's now we're, what a twelve years. But um, I had never, up to that point, I was like, oh, it'll probably be, you know, maybe 20 years from now or 10 more years from now, I'll do an art book. But um, so, yeah, it was, it came as a surprise. And I, and I was super honored that John wanted to work with me because I've loved the books that Flesk Publication has put out as well as um, when, he, when he was in charge of Spectrum for, I think, seven or eight Spectrums. Um, I, I just love the, the work that he did. I love the art books that he created. Some of my favorites, like most the hard to find art books it came out of Flesk. So um, right. it was really exciting to get to work with him and he's been awesome this whole way through. So tons, tons of great work um, coming out of there. Right. 
So in a way you get to kind of join a legacy, right? Yeah, I guess it is a weird thing to think about, but I guess it is. That, that is the case. It's <laughs> pretty cool. I'm, I, I'm just, it's, I don't know. You, when you're in the now of it, I'm just sort of like excited to get the book out there and for people to see it. And I'm really excited to have it and hold it myself. Um, yeah. So it it's, it's surreal. Every time I'll get like every few weeks, I'll get a spread from, John and his folks over there, um, Kathy and Vicky, and and it's like, oh, it's getting each step, it's getting more and more real. You know, the the text is all formatted, and and now the images are all formatted and laid out the right way, and the the double page spreads are solved, and so it's it's like each little incremental step is like more and more closer to the book becoming real, and um, and then the Kickstarter started, and. That that was super exciting and is continuing. I think the the last ten days of it's going to be really fun. Yeah, we're going to have we're going to have all kinds of um, we're going to have a, another stretch goal coming in, and then we'll probably do like a final stretch goal to see if we can push it to the the last bit of um, funding we want to get to, and and then the book will be real and we can actually get it to people this year, which is incredible. So yeah, it is actually wow. I think by the time you finish signing all the books, you're going to have to sign. You're going to be like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be able to I'm paint for to days. Go. Your hands are going to be all cramped up. <laughs> I think that that's going to end up being a trip because I'll, I'll have to, there's no way vacation. John can send me all of the p books. And then like, I'm going to have to go to his um, office in Santa Cruz and, and sign everything. So, which will be great because Santa Cruz is very nice. It's going to be wild. <laughs> it's a very nice place. <laughs> Yeah, can't can't complain really. Yeah, yeah, and well, I'm doing so, like so. I, I don't think they're available anymore because they were all bought. But I'm doing like a hundred little drawings in one hundred of the books. So that'll be a that'll be a fun task. I'm really excited <laughs> to to try and do really cool individual <laughs> ones. I'm really hoping I can do cool individual ones, and and not get into like, oh, I'm just going to draw a skull each time. I want to try and do 100 individual little drawings. So we'll see how that goes. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to get to need... number 40 and you're going to be like, mm. yeah, I'm going to need a, <laughs> need one of those like super tight carpal tunnel gloves or something. <laughs> yeah, probably. So what did it feel like to have, like you guys reached your goal so fast. Did you, were you expecting it was going to happen or was it a surprise to see how much support the book got? Um, I did not know what to expect. Um, I think John had a, has, a, has done so many of these because um, it's, it's the system he uses to fund publishing. Um, so I think he'd done enough that he knew what was going to occur on the first day, but he wasn't, he wasn't going to say anything because he didn't want to create any expectations in my mind. So I was just blown away because I didn't know. I was like, oh, maybe we'll get funding in like a few weeks. That'll be cool. But we got it in the first like hour, a couple hours. Yep. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay, all right. Um, this is real. This is happening now. <laughs> So yeah, I, so I, was crazy. Just, I was in shock. I, I'm still in a bit of shock about it. So, Is it a little bit weird to know that that many people connect that strongly to the work that you make? Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a good feeling. It's a feel good. I, you know, often, I don't know, most illustrators I know we work in our studios and never go, we rarely see people. So to have our have your work like out there and received by lots of people in a, in a positive way is awesome. Um, I, I tend to only have exposure to that through like magic. Cause I go to magic tournaments and, and I an artist on the side and there's people who want you to sign their cards. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. There's right. a little like micro fan base here and, and it's very nice. And so to see like that many people support the book immediately, was awesome. Um, it's really cool. And I hope, I hope everyone likes the book when they actually have it in their hand. So, I'm super excited for you, man. I think that this, I mean, not only is it just super cool, like there is now out there in the world, there's going to be books full of things that you have made, which is like the raddest thing. Um, well, I hope it's the also, first one and not the last. <laughs> right. I was going to say it's the stepping stone, right? Who knows what comes after that? Hopefully another book. Let's say another right. book. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're gonna have to make a whole I mean you well you said that you guys had to cut a whole bunch so I guess you still have a, a whole bunch of material you can still use if you want to right yeah I'm hoping that if I'm hoping it's enough we could make like maybe a volume two or something like that it would be really cool um because you know we had to cut a lot of stuff and and I had to I actually was cutting stuff that was like quote unquote famous pieces of mine that so they're not even in this book um not right. all of them but a, a select number of them are not in this one. So it's like, well, I kind of want these to be in something sometime. So I'm hoping, hopefully this, hopefully this, this does really great. And, um, you know, all the, however, I don't know a lot about being a salesman or any of that, but hopefully the sales stuff is great and we can <laughs> put together another one in the future. Yeah. Fingers crossed. I can't wait to get mine. Um, I jumped on that sucker as soon as it was out. I was like, yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Give, oh, yeah. Had to have it, man. Um, well, I hope it's so one that I hope it's one that is, will be signed by me, but if not, I'll have to I sign it for I'm you. I'm pretty sure that it is. I'm pretty sure I grabbed the one. I was like, well, I have to have that. So, um, Oh, cool. Well, and we're yeah. offering prints and stuff too, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's super awesome. And um, like, I, I love them. The, the My kiddo has, I think, two or three in his bedroom. So we, we've already got Oh, cool. Tyler Which Jacobs one? and Art in the house. Um, he loves Don Break Reclaimer. I think that's his oh, cool. favorite of your work. Cool. So he's got that one. And then um, I'm going to forget the name. It's the fish. It's the fish guy standing over oh, the yeah. waterfall. Oh, yeah. You know what? Funnily enough, I can't remember his name either. Um, <laughs> it's, it's it's definitely, what is it? Kumana, I think. Kumana. Yeah. Oh, I think, I think it's it Kumana. is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cool. I love that yeah, one. That fun. one was fun. Cause that was one of the weird ones yeah, where I, it was like, I have to, the design constraint is that he's in the water. So it's like, okay. So it's basically a dark figure on a, on a white background. Cause it's, it's a right. waterfall. Um, so yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah. It's and super it's cool. Funny. Those, I think those are his two favorites. Oh, sweet. The, the, um, if I'm Dawn break reclaimer is the, is that the angel? Yes, the, the 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 angel who looks like the Lady of Justice. So the angel of justice. Right. She's got the scales and the sword. Yeah. My um cousin is a district attorney in Portland, or he works for the DA, and so he's an attorney. And he was like, "I need a print of this." So I, that was actually a Christmas. <laughs> gift I got him. That. It was a big um. Nice. It was a big canvas print of that one that hangs in his uh, office at Portland City Hall. <laughs> so that's, that's awesome. Pretty cool. One. Yeah, I um, I. I had planned on, so I've, I've been photographing angels. I have a series going and I thought it would be really cool. I'll do like the angel of mercy and the angel of justice. And I'll just like do all of these things. And so I started making like props and stuff out of foam. And so this is my most recent make. Whoa. Oh, awesome. The scales. That's great. Scales of justice thing. So I was putting it together and then I, I went in to get my kid to do something. And I look and there's Don break reclaimer. And I'm like, Oh <laughs> shit. <laughs> I have to make sure That's I do it cool, really though. differently. <laughs> oh, just do it the same. It, but, a, a photo, like a photo version of that painting would be really cool to see. <laughs> um, but I love, yeah. I've, I've been seeing all the prop stuff you've been doing and it's the props you've been making are amazing. Super cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. It's fun. It's just, this is what happens when you can't afford the cool stuff. <laughs> you have to figure out ways to make it for yourself. Yeah. So, oh, but I see someday I want to support all the amazing artists because there's, <gasps> do we get one yay all right well, i was gonna say it's, it's a hello guy I know. my the, friend the hi great, tyler will you have some great early... donato <gasps> i will um, um i was just hanging and with donato will you and, have and... early childhood art i will i will um i'm doing a whole section that's actually the the front we front loaded the book with just a bunch of drawings of mine um from like when i was super little and then my like high school attempts to draw the lord of the rings and um and x-men and stuff like that so it's like the whole front is a bunch of pages of of i was cringing looking at these but i, I they're super fun like one of them was a a comic that i did i don't know spoilers for everyone who is waiting for the book um but one of them is a comic i did of our principal is really loved star trek and i am an absolute star trek lunatic so i did a comic of him like fighting klingons and our cafeteria or something like that um but it's like my first time it was like i don't know i was in i was a 
sophomore or something in high school and I'd never inked a whole comic page. So um, I even did the letters and everything. <laughs> so yeah, all that's that's, um, that stuff's going to be there. And Dang. like, I think my first commission was in high school. So that, that commission is in there for a play. And um, so, yeah, we're doing a, I think we have three or four pages of really fun, old young kid, Tyler art. So thanks for the question, Donato. Very cool. Yes. I love that you have that. Yes, <laughs> guys, had to, um, I had we've to already have been it. on for an hour and almost a half. So if you if you have the questions, man, get them in there. Get them in there now because we're going to close down here pretty soon. So ask Tyler all the things. This is oh, chance. Yeah. Um, and so as we're waiting for folks to, to make sure that they ask, I know the time goes by so fast. It makes me oh, sad. you know, it's cool. Um, it's always great to chat. So. I know. Ah, I'm so sad that you still live in Washington and I don't anymore. <laughs> like, That's right. You said you were from up in this area, country. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I was born in Cowlitz County. So, so oh, cool. not, not that far South. Yeah. Native Washingtonian. Yep. Um, so what I want to ask you, and I didn't get to ask you actually in our first interview, which is, which kind of became a hallmark of these interviews at the end of the show and became a really interesting topic for conversation. And actually that is this week's topic for conversation in our morning walk, um, kind of our, our, our talk show in the morning, but is, um, what is your why? So why? why art why illustration i mean you could you could do any job right like you could have been a mechanic sure. or an engineer oh, or boy. anything else so why do you make for a living i did go to i originally went to school to be a biologist so this is actually a great question it's a very good why question because i i did what two and a half years of a like basically like pre-veterinary bio degree and chemistry like kicked my butt so bad that I was like, I'm out of here. I am out. Um, and I still love science, of course, but it was just like, ah, I can't do it. There's too much statistics. There's too much numbers. Um, that stuff, the, the like nuts and bolts of being like a research scientist was way too difficult. So, and it just wasn't as exciting as just like the general broad concepts of science are, which is why I still love everything about like cosmology and space travel and, um, biology and evolution and all that stuff. I love it, but I don't want to be a professional at it. Um, so the why, I guess, I think the why is I've always been drawn to, like we were talking about cinematography and storytelling. And it's always, the why has always been storytelling for me. I've always wanted to depict all the weird things in my imagination. And I think when I was younger, I realized like I could actually kind of draw these things out and as I, you know, went to art school and learned the skills to do that in a better way, in a more professional way, um, it was, it just became the thing, the, the reason that I wanted to put all of my energy into it, I wanted to tell interesting stories through imagery. Um, I wanted to, to not just tell any story, but to basically take stories that I'd heard or stories that I created and, and display them through like my own lens. Um, so that's why I, um, I have some of the work I had in art school that'll be in the art book as well as it's like, I want to, I want to put like Moby Dick through my lens. How do I perceive this, this narrative? Um, and I did that with um, like Beowulf and Grendel. And um, I think I did some stuff from like interview with the vampire in art school. And it was just like, I, I like these stories, these narratives, and I want to sort of push those, uh, those imagery through my own, lens which is like my own perception uh, the way i see the world and what aesthetically what is interesting to me um and that's kind of become a big part of the stuff that i do when it comes to like visual development for magic and D is taking their older stuff that they've that has been established for a long time and then putting it through a new lens um my, my own lens like how, how do i want to update this to my aesthetic or what's what's appropriate and uh, modern aesthetics you know it's like everything gets an update right if, over the years there's there's always remakes you know there's like the original so mutiny on the bounty and then there's the right. there's a mutiny on the bounty with um mel gibson and th there's there's the original last mohicans then there's the last mohicans the michael mann last mohicans with 
Danny Day Lewis. So it's like everything gets a lens update. And I, I really enjoy that because I'm such a nut about movies as well. I like to do that with art and to take imagery and, and update them or put a narrative through my own lens. I, I'm rambling at this point, but that, that's, that's the why. <laughs> what do you think it is about putting it through your lens, about being able to share your take on it that makes it worth doing this? Because it's not an easy way to make a living. Right. And it, it, it takes a long time for most people to do well. So what is it about being able to translate this stuff with your own language that draws you so much? Um, that's a good question. I think it's, there's a certain amount of frustration when you're like learning to become an artist of, I can't seem to get what's in my head on the page. Um, I can't, I don't have the tools to draw that thing that I want. Like I want to, let's say I want to draw that person's face and I have a photo of that face and I can't seem to make it look like that. Um, there's this like frustration. And as you break down the little barriers of, Oh, okay. That's how I draw um, a form that's turning in the light, or that's how I, that's how I deal with specular highlights. That's how I deal with hair. That's how I deal with, as you learn all these little tools, the image that's in your head can now be focused. Um, and you start to get better and better at putting what's in your mind on the page. And for me, that that those little incremental um, increases in the accuracy, like in introducing the fidelity that's in my head to the page and getting it more, giving it more and more fidelity and more and more clarity. Um, it's like focusing a lens, essentially. Um, that is really satisfying to me. So that's the that's the driver is to constantly be able to really bring my imagination to the page and early on like you know like my first few days in art school was like wow i can't do this at all i can't i can't get these images out at all i don't have the tools to do it and then you know years and years of training and practice um i'm, I'm getting a better ability to focus that lens Right. I like that. Like, and I'm Diego, that. I see your comment and I'm going to, I'm going to grab it in just a second. Um, but what I want to ask, and you just made me think of Tyler is, uh, do you think any of that has to do for you with being a really intimate way that you get to engage with things that you already love? Like once you do that, you almost get to become, you get to become part of, part of the story, right? Like you're, you're reinterpreting or you're sharing how something lives in your mind. And in a way, um, especially for work, we don't like we didn't get to collaborate with Tolkien on Lord of the Rings and we didn't get to right. do any of that stuff. But if we paint our version of it or we draw our version of it in a way, we get to kind of live that along with the artist and become part of that. Is there any of that, I think, that resonates with you at all? Yeah, I know. I totally think so. Um, I think it's allowing you know, like I was saying, it's like me try, struggling really hard over the years to focus the image that's in my head. There's that level of engagement now that I can have with the, the people that view the art is now I can be like, see, this is what, you know, it's like when when someone reads a book and they think that they know what the character looks like and and then they, right. you know, they're arguing with someone who's like, no, I think he would look like this or he'd look like this actor, not this actor. He'd look, he would look like more like, um, you know, Ian McShane would play this character or something. <laughs> Um, and in the arguing over like, well, no, in my head, I kind of see, you know, Gary Oldman or something. Um, so being able to be like, see, this is what, how I perceived it, especially, you know, if I'm like illustrating Lord of the Rings or something or any other popular um, fantasy property, it's like, this is how I see it. Now I'm letting you see how I perceive it. And, and we can connect in that way. Now you can see my perspective on something that, you may really like. And I think that's really interesting. I love seeing other artists take on, you know, Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings or um, any of anything like sci-fi stuff. I, I'm, I'm really excited by seeing their, their perception of, of something um, that I've also shared um, as a, as a narrative or as a book or a movie or anything. Yeah, absolutely. So ultimately in a, in a big way, it becomes a vehicle for connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it totally is. Um, it's like inviting somebody into your head for yeah, a little bit. which uh, and in, in huge doses would fucking make you go crazy. Pardon my French, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, but 
it, it would make you go crazy, right? But if you can give people like an edited version of um, what's going on in your brain, it's pretty nice. It, like, it's a cool way to yeah. um, communicate with somebody. And I think that goes like way back to yeah. you know, the roots of human society. Like, how do we, if, if before we had language, it was probably pictorial. You know, if we were trying to communicate, it might have been pictorial right. or, or we tried to communicate pictorially once we had language because it was maybe an easier way to communicate ideas. So, um, that's, right. I don't know. It's, it's a fun thing to be a part of a, a long continuum of, of visual storytelling. Yeah. I mean, there's an intimacy there, you know, I mean, there, there's an intimacy there and being able to take a piece of what's inside of you and put that out and be like, this is for all the people who see, like I see. That's pretty cool. Well, and there's, there's a certain, I guess, intimacy and vulnerability too, right? Cause it's like, what if, what if they think my perception of this, what if they think it's stupid or, or completely wrong or, you know, th there's that like level of exposure. Like you have to expose your ego to the universe. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's it's scary, so but it's, it's also really kind of nice to say like, well, this is how I think it is. And if you don't like it, you don't have to look at it, but it's, <laughs> this is my perception and, and check it out. Do you like it? I mean, that's kind of, I feel like that's like the basis of all art, right? It's like, Hey, I, yeah. I put my hand on the wall and I sprayed some paint around it. Do you like it? What do you think? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you like it. If you don't look somewhere else, yeah. geez. I drew a Buffalo so, in this cave wall. Do you like it? <laughs> yeah. So Diego said, wow, I came across this interview by pure chance. Just want to to show Tyler my appreciation and love for his work, maybe asking if he can talk about any upcoming projects. All right. So any other upcoming projects, Tyler, you can talk about besides the book that's about to launch. And the link is in the <laughs> comments, guys, if you want to contribute and yes. get in on that Kickstarter with the stretch goals, go jump in and do that. So anything else you can tell us that is coming um, up? Un unfortunately, the nature of my job is I would do a lot of work for, you know, for, um, Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so unfortunately, I can never talk about any of that stuff until it's released. Um, but what, what um, now I really, there's nothing I can actually talk about there. <laughs> but, but yeah, the book's coming out. That's cool. Um, and I think, I don't know if, if the folks on here have seen, um, I used to, we're just kind of on a hiatus, um, but I, I would do a, a live stream on Twitch with my friend Ray Bonilla and we would paint and chat. Um, basically, we would we would paint random stuff. I think we started out by painting just like pop culture '80s movie actors that we loved, and just we would just talk shop basically. So we'd spend a few hours just painting and talking shop. Um, and we're we're hoping to bring that back soon. Um, Ray's got some. He's been yeah. you know kind of busy with stuff, so um, he's starting to free up, and we're hoping to bring that back soon. Hopefully, in the next few months. Um, so we, if any of you folks out there were big fans of live brush, we will be coming back and doing our usual bullshit, just talking <laughs> and, <laughs> nice. and being silly. I mean, like half the time we and just talk about movies, honestly, we're painting, but we just talk about movies that we love for the whole two hours. <laughs> And tell me that some you still plan someday on painting darkness, right? Is, is that still in the cards for the future? Oh, I did. So yeah, um, I did on the I, maybe like the last episode of Live Brush that we did. I painted darkness from um, the movie that we debate on Live Brush all the time, which is um, a Ridley Scott film called Legend. Um, Thomas Blackshear did the amazing movie poster for it, and we debate the movie a lot because some people. My wife really likes the Tangerine Dream soundtrack that was originally released with that movie. And I, and both Ray and I, are really big fans of the Jerry Goldsmith, um, the master movie composer, um, Jerry Goldsmith's score for Legend. So I think we've spent, I'm, you know, we did two seasons of the show, and I swear we spent 25 to 30% of that show arguing about Legend. So... Of course, one of the episodes I had to paint the I had to paint darkness. Um, Tim Curry's um, crazy makeup monster that he was in he was in the suit for, uh, and I never finished that. So uh, maybe I'll reapproach. I was gonna say I feel There's like a lot I haven't of red. seen it. 
And yeah, I feelings... did like I did most of it, but I didn't finish it. And I was going to I was going to finish it on the next episode. But then we kind of had to end the season because things were going on and things were getting hectic. So w- once things settle right. back down, we'll get back into it. But I have a whole bunch of other I I didn't do Bruce Campbell on the on the stream, but I that's right. definitely going to do an Evil Dead painting um, on the stream for sure, because if happen. we go if we go all of live brush without me touching evil dead it will be a crime so <laughs> <laughs> definitely it will be it will be a crime against humanity uh sounds awesome right on diego oh, thank you Thanks, for diego. asking your question yeah sorry i can't right, talk about this so always that... cool really cool things will be coming out soon <laughs> Yes, yes. And we get our hands on the book. So I'm excited about that. Um, Really, really grateful that you came on again, Tyler, to chat. I love getting the chance to talk with you. And I think um, my interwebs have had a little bit of an issue today. So I'm going to have to sort that out. I wasn't expecting bad connectivity. Um, Uh, But hopefully it won't be the last time. I'm going to keep snagging up every chance I get. I love it. All right, everybody. Thank you for showing up here today. Thanks for coming and hanging out. Don't forget that you can go and check out. We do morning walk and photo talk on Clubhouse every single morning as part of the Artist Forge. And now the Artist Forge is building up a little bit. And the platform is basically all about mindset and approach and how you think like an artist, because this is the most important thing that we've got. And all of the technique in the world won't do us any good if we don't know how to put it to use and why to put it to use. So that is what we're going to be focusing on there. You'll be able to rewatch this interview and I'm going to write up an article about it. So that is going to be on the artistforge.com if you want to go check that out. Um, and go make sure you follow the link. It is in the comments. I will put it in the description of this video. The Kickstarter is running until? Um, 10 days from now. Um, on my birthday, it ends August 5th. Ah, August 5th. So if you want to get in on that, you better go in the next 10 days, go sign up, go get the goodies. Uh, You are not going to regret it. You got a chance to see Tyler's art. It's amazing. You definitely want to have that book in your house. So go check that out. And hopefully you will join us for the next interview. I am snagging people, amazing artists and lining them up for the future. So we will have just a continuous rollout of some of the best creators out there to talk about what it means to be an artist and and create and how we approach things and what it is like just to work in this field. So hopefully you'll come and join us for that. And until next time, everybody go make amazing things and we will see you in the future. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having me.